Hi everyone, I'm Lynn Langett and welcome to this lunch uh, webcast from Developmentor. I'm going to be talking for the next hour about SQL Server 2012 top features. You can access this deck which includes a lot of links with additional information as well as a demo code um, via my uh, blog which is my name, lynnlangett.com. Also, this presentation will be recorded and it will be available uh, after this time period. So if you wish to uh, get the presentation, show someone else, um, or just review it yourself, that, that will be fine. Um, you might also wish to uh, follow me on Twitter. I am um, at sign L Langett. So we have lots to cover, so we're going to get started. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask them in the chat. I will um, probably take them at the end of the, the webcast because we have lots of, lots of information. So my goal in this hour is to give you an introduction to SQL Server 2012 top features. And what I want to do is uh, filter sort of the lens of Microsoft speak, if you will, in, into a, a reality for those of us working data professionals and talk about what aspects of 2012 um, are most interesting to the customers that I work with. Some of you may know that I have um, been uh, working directly with the Microsoft Teams as a Microsoft employee up until recently. I left the company after four years uh, um, in October of this year to go back into the contracting world because of some of the exciting things that are happening around, around the world of data. So when Microsoft talks about um, why you care about SQL Server 2012, they talk about three areas. They talk about breakthrough insights, mission critical, and cloud on your terms, which kind of, you know, what does that mean? So we're going to translate that into some uh, features and functions, and I'm going to do lots of demos over this hour so you can see what these things are and um, get an understanding of how they might be uh, valuable for your business. So I'm going to start with business intelligence uh, because that's the area I'm most known for and I do the most production work in. Those of you who have um, worked with me for a while or looked at my work might know that I have written a couple books and I've done um, quite a bit of production work before I joined Microsoft actually building out business intelligence solutions um, using SQL Server 2005 and 2008. Actually, I started with SQL Server 7. So there's a whole bunch of new features and I couldn't possibly go through all of them in an hour, but I'm going to take sort of the best of and give you an introduction to. So just to, to pull these features into a list that you could think about um, in terms of the ones that you might look at it and review, um, we've got uh, this thing called PowerView, which used to be called Crescent, which is if you're a full Microsoft shop and you have a SharePoint, it's a new way to visualize um, the results of either um, OLAP cubes or the new uh, tabular BI semantic models. And to that extent, um, a, a really sort of important uh, an additional change is we have a, a new semantic model. And this is based on Power Pivot, and it's uh, in Analysis Services. We have what's called tabular mode, and I'm actually going to be showing that in, in just a couple minutes here. Um, another set of features kind of go together are data quality services and master data services. And the idea here is um, taking your core reference data and um, having a central repository for it in Master Data Services and um, having a set of tools that can help you address data quality issues both for that master data and for um, data that's, that's incremental as well. So I'm going to be actually showing data quality services here in a minute. Um, the next thing is just a, a huge engine enhancement. It's called VertiPack, which is the, the column store um, the indexing, which results in substantially improved performance for um, querying against huge data sets. Another set of interesting features is semantic search and uh, the file table data type. So there certainly are more, but these would be sort of the top level um, things that I, I'm interested in around the BI space. So to that end, we're going to start with something that is, uh, is, is also new in this space. I didn't list on that slide because it's, it's so new. There's a, a new product out that you can try out. I have a link in the slide called Data Explorer. And the idea is in the BI lifecycle, it goes kind of in the quality, cleansing, transforming area um, that you're going to take a um, bunch of different data, and I've got a screen here and I'll, I'll demo this in just a minute, and you're going to mash it up. Now you might say, well, this is the same as, you know, power pivot. How is, how is this different than, than mashing up? Well, the difference is in addition to, to um, 
connecting and retrieving this data, as you'll see when I demo this, um, the idea is to expose lightweight ETL, or the, the T of ETL, the transform, um, via a ribbon-like interface. So it looks like an office product, like Excel specifically, so that somebody who has more of a focus on um, domain knowledge, who's an analyst first, and sort of a, a data professional maybe second, um, in terms of the VBA, um, can take the data, pull it in, mash it up, and clean it up, and then package it for export and consumption by another uh, viewing um, uh, uh, set of viewer, which could be the Power Viewer, could be Power Pivot, or could be reporting services or whatever. So I'm going to just dive off the slides here, and I've got um, I've got Data Explorer set up, and this again, this is a this is a beta right now, just released a couple weeks ago. This beta. The idea is that you can either use this tool on your desktop, the way I have it here, or you can um, use the cloud-based um, version of this. Now, the, the reason, and I actually blogged about this in more detail, the reason I'm using the desktop version at this time is because I use Google Chrome as my primary browser, and um, the, the web uh, implementation is not optimized for Chrome, so it, it really crashes a lot. And I spoke with a team about this, and they said they are focusing on i.e. Um, performance uh, first, which I guess kind of makes sense. So that's why I'm using this. So the way that this thing works is you, um, you, you, know, you open it up from the start menu and you get Data Explorer. Um, it also integrates into Excel. So so um, ML is um, I will do it. So, yeah. um, ribbon, and you can see data explorer now is exposed as I can just open it, or I can um, import um, the product of data explorer into Excel, and that's a, um, it's, a it's called a data explorer map. I'll see when we open it up here. And then you could, you know, further manipulate, view, whatever. Yeah, it's called um, you, from your workspace, you can pull in um, a data explorer file, which I just, they're not, they're not specifically called Nash, but I just called it that. So anyway, so if I want to, if I want to create um, a new Nash uh, uh, up, I can connect you another to Excel. Um, or a really and because you know it has this lightweight sort of context, so I'm gonna connect uh, maybe to a slow sequence on that. You can see something on um, SQL Server talk on the course for this presentation. And I've got the R C will work. The mashup doesn't work. You can see this little thing. You can give the data input. So what it's doing is it's data action. So every time it creates, I'm going to just connect with my tools. It creates a pathway. Now I like this and I don't like it. I like it because it's a singular pathway, and you can click on any step and go back to it. Pretty intuitive, but it looks like only a single path at this point. Um, uh, I'll change. So it's a nice easier. And then um, once it connects, connect, select some data, and then do a little bit of manipulation just to, to show you how it works. And I, so hopefully the audio is okay. I'm, I'm seeing a little feedback. If the audio is not okay, let let Mary know, and I can maybe switch to the phone. So there we've got the databases, and then I want to I want to use this one. So I'm going to open the selection, and then I can I can work in one of the tables here. So I can go to the employee table, and open a selection. And of course I could add or mash up data to this, and that data could come from all those different sources that you saw. And now when I go in here, if I want to like do something with this data, I can click on a column, and I can go more tools, and then it's going to show me tools that are relevant. So it's exposing the ETL tools that are relevant. So you know, insert I could do you know flatten so on and so forth. I also have this ability to do statistical sampling, 
so I can um, have some sense of what this data looks like. Again, the big thing you're going to hear all through BI is the ability to mash up or work with different kinds of data. And let's say that I wanted to say, um, just to show you what, you can also see that there's the language. I'll just, just order something. Uh, but again, I, don't, I won't belabor this self discover. I think let's save it. And then you can go back and you can snapshot it and you can package it up as we'll see when we go back to my workspace here. And then there it is. And you can preview it, you can snapshot it, so on and so forth. So kind of an interesting thing. So that's the uh, introduction to Data Explorer. If you want to try it out, the team's really looking for a lot of feedback there. The next uh, thing that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, the, the BI semantic model, which uh, is very significant in the BI space. So um, what that looks like is this, and I've, I've got that open and installed here. So what's going on here is this is um, SQL Server Data Tools, which um, ships with, of course, 2012. And when you install analysis services, you have uh, an option to install either the UDM, which is the traditional OLAP cubes, or you can install the new um, tabular model, which is shown here. This is an example model that, that I built really quick like. And this is a, a power pivot sort of um, uh, implementation in that you uh, just say file, new, and then project, and then you create a single model, um, and you go to business intelligence, and you, you create um, an analysis services tabular project. You can also import um, just a file, or you can import from power pivot, so you have this interoperability. So you basically have VertiPack running on, on the server. So what's interesting then is um, when you are working, we've got the new model here. We ought to, and this is to, to release a power pivot as well. Um, you um, also have the sort of the table view, if you will. And then if we um, want to create some uh, measures, then we would just find something that's numeric. So let's see, what do we have here? So, table. so here's the extended one. You can see some of unit by so I'll take extended amount and then I go up here to the tour and I click on the, the aggregator, um, extended amount, what might I want? Maybe the average of that for a measure. Um, and this could be a very, very simple model. What to me is interesting about this, I'm just going to look at this, um, is that by default, it's flat. In other words, it doesn't have to be a little bit different way. And you'll see now that I've created this average, I can actually create a, a KPI, a server-based KPI. I can see that um, I say that uh, on the average, I want to take this particular measure, and then I want to set the threshold, and I can set it to be you know, more complex if I want to. It's, again, pretty discoverable and intuitive. I, the idea is to you know, make BI more accessible. Um, for people who hadn't had the time or inclination to, to work with that um, and so we have the time to process this table. So this new KPI comes up here. I have to connect to my vacancy process. Go out. Once my machine catch up, and I'll show you. And so also the data tools. I'll go here and go to the properties. SQL Server Data Tools encapsulate the um, Business Intelligence Development Studio. So the interesting thing, and there's a good blog post that I referenced on the slide about the differences between the query mode, whether it's in-memory, direct query, direct query with in-memory, or in-memory with direct query. 
really does matter in terms of performance. So, I mean, I'm just kind of showing you how it looks. There's, there's certainly lots more um, to know about the, the semantic model. Um, kind, of, kind of interesting, though, to see. And here's your, here's your ability to, to work with the model, model, table, column, so on and so forth. So I'm going to um, close this one out and uh, I'm going to save my changes. Oops, I guess it's not there. So I'm going to go ahead and not save changes. And then I'm going to show you how this looks in uh, Management Studio. So no. And switch over to Management Studio. I'm going to wait a minute for this to catch up. And, and um, what was interesting to me as I was playing around with this is, you know, this is a semantic model or a semantic layer. And the, the language that you use inside of analysis services, when working in tabular mode, is DAX. It's the data expression language, the same thing used in Power Pivot. But when you go to work with this thing in um, Management Studio, and this is how Management Studio looks. It looks like Visual Studio in terms of coloring and stuff. Here, I'll just show you. So it's a 2012 RC0. Um, you connect here to analysis services, but when you're in tabular mode, you, if you have really sharp eyes, you might see this is a little blue square rather than the cube because this is tabular mode. However, when you go to query it, you'll notice here this query is not DAX. This query is MDX. So, you know, it is a semantic model that sits on top of um, the the OLAP, which is really kind of kind of interesting, and and I'm maybe not being as specific as the team would like here, but um, uh, I can see this in, in the genesis of it. Okay, so I'm seeing that Mary's saying her audio is bad. Hopefully, you guys can all hear me. Okay, I'm just taking a look here. Looks okay. Okay, and let me go off here. All right, so next. Let me go out of here and close this out. Say no. Go back to my slide. I gave you like a really quick um, view of the semantic and the, and the data explorer. Another set of services that I'll be doing uh, lots more presentations on is this data quality services and master data services. So I'll, I'll just jump over and actually show you what that looks like too. I think it's easier to show you the product. So here's data quality services, and the way this comes up is it's not configured by default. So in 2012, you go here, and you have data quality services. So you have the data quality service installer, which you need to run, and then uh, you'll open the data quality client. So that's kind of the mechanics of, of working with it. So inside of here, you got the idea that you have um, domains so that um, those domains are, you know, knowledge domains, if you will. So in this case, I just preloaded some geography data just to make it easy to understand. And you can see that I have countries and regions, so on and so forth, U.S. last names. This would be for, like, um, cleansing data projects. And so what I've done is I've, I've done a search on a country that I know about because I happen to go there and do volunteer work, which is Zambia. And you can see that in the reference data has three different types. So it has this, this number to identify Zambia, the, this name, Republic of Zambia, ZM and ZMB. So one of you know, the things you can do in here is you can say, well, in this case, 894, this is not correct. So we do not want it to, um, to correct to, to Zambia. So now it's going to update that into the domain. Um, and then when you process data against the angel, then 894 Zambia which is really, you know, what's going on here. So you can see now um, that has actually removed it. Now, if I said ZMB was not an error, but it was, um, you know, it was a warn, then you could uh, look at that. So there's the concept of the domain management, and there's the concept of the, of the matching. So lots and lots, lots to look at here, all new set of tools, and uh, watch my uh, web, uh, website. Uh, blog, I mean, for uh, more more webcasts and, and things about this. So I'll be creating a presentation about an hour um, just to get people uh, started with this. So, all right, we go out of there and go here. Okay, so data quality services, um, and like I said, lots more in the realm of BI, but I just showed a couple of things. So the next thing is to talk about is the um, mission critical which means in uh, your, your, in my terms, always on. And what it means is um, it's, it's called high availability um, disaster recovery or high availability disaster recovery always on. So 
H-A-D-R-O-N or H-A-D-R. So um, another way is high availability data distribution, and it is a better mirroring, if you will. So the concept is that you have the ability to mirror in groups and that you have the ability to set the mirroring criteria. So policy-based failover and that now the secondaries can be readable or asynchronous. So it's a, a really, really highly requested feature. I, I'm less of a DBA and more of a database developer, but I do a little bit of DBA work and my, my sort of hardcore DBA friends are super interested in this. Now I didn't um, set up a multi-server environment because I thought it would be a little bit uh, just too much for a one-hour webcast. But what I did do is I got this cool demo that comes actually out of the kit, and I'll show you where this is. Um, this is in the, the, um, the SQL Server uh, samples that you can get online, and it's the always-on availability groups. So I'm going to just run and talk through this demo. It's a click-through demo. Um, because I think that a lot of you guys are going to be um, interested in this and you're going to want proof of concepts and to try it out. So this, and I also have references to all the steps, by the way. So what they're doing here is they're showing you the node in Management Studio um, where you click on the availability groups and you have a wizard and then you give it a name. And of course it's faster because this is a click through. And then you pick the databases, and they have to have them backed up. They have to have the log turned on, so they can't be in simple recovery mode. And then um, you're going to specify if you're going to your, where your secondary uh, replica is. So there it is. And then notice you have replica modes: automatic failover or manual, with disallow connections to that the replicas or allow. So, and I, I know that this is a pre-RC, this is Denali, but it still works, I, I think, basically the same. I haven't run it on, on, 20, on RC0, but I assume so. So you can see it's in high safety mode there, which means it has to commit on both sides. And there, this one they're setting for something different. Now that they're setting things. And they're setting up the listener, basically. And then they're setting up their initial data synchronization and finishing the wizard. Now it's just saying all the different choices that you've set up, showing you the details. And just showing you it's done. Checking out the availability group. Sailing over as a group is the concept based on conditions. And there they're showing the primaries and the secondaries, so the replicas, the listeners, just looking at the different things. Showing the databases that are participating. Showing the synchronization. Showing whether or not connections are allowed to the secondary.
and just completing the 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 um, showing that it's working basically. So I I know it was a little bit uh, uh, so it was nice to see a live demo, but hey, for the amount of time that we had, it's a very sort of handy thing. Also, I, I does look like I have a client. I'm going to set this up on pretty soon, so I will blog about what my experience is in setting it up. Uh, the blogs that I've read have been pretty positive, so um, I'm feeling pretty pretty happy about trying this out. So uh, let me get out of here, okay, and then go back over here. So that's the that's the big part. I mean, there are other things, but that's sort of the big offering in the in the mission critical I was on. So that's the high availability. Um, distributed data. So the next um, whole chunk of things is around cloud on your terms, which you might think is just SQL Azure, but it's a whole set of services around cloud. So um, and integration with um, SQL Server 2012 and cloud-based data providers, whether they're Microsoft or not. So the first thing is the update to the developer tools, which is I showed you in the um, tabular um, uh, analysis services model, that's the um, SQL Server data tools, and I showed you the, the, the BI semantic model and how, um, how, pow how it's power pivot basically on the server. There, so there's a whole bunch of stuff in SQL Server data tools, and I'll be showing you that in just a minute. Probably the biggest thing is the version targeting. So you have IntelliSense based on the, the version and addition of SQL Server inside of Visual Studio. So what that means from a practical point is if you're trying to implement a feature that is not supported, so for example, file groups on SQL Azure, um, and you have that in your script, your metadata script, it'll warn you and say, no, you can't do that in SQL Azure. Um, if you're trying to implement a version, a feature in some version uh, 2012 that's not in 2008, something like um, some of the new geospatial methods, um, there's some, uh, we'll be getting into that more in, in, later in this webcast, but there's some ability to support complex geometrical shapes and complex curves and things like that, some enhancements to geospatial. And if you tried to use that and then you targeted in your dev tools to 2008, it would say, no, can't use it in this particular um, uh, implementation. So uh, this, this, these tools used to be called Project Juno. Um, they all release at the same time as uh, SQL Server 2012. and uh, they will integrate with Visual Studio 2010, or they'll be a standalone shell. Um, another set of uh, tools that we have around cloud is data synchronization, which I'll show you how that works from the portal. The idea is you can synchronize uh, SQL Azure data um, to SQL Azure or to on-premise, and uh, there's a lot of flexibility there. Another uh, aspect of uh, Microsoft's cloud offering is moving the BI stuff up into the cloud. And you can see that you, have, you saw that with Data Explorer that I want to start out with because there is a cloud-based beta of that. That's it's a kind of an ETL or kind of an SSIS on the cloud. Um, you'll also see a portal that we've got reporting services. Um, so the rendering report is in cloud. If that was announced this week, there were a lot of Azure announcements this week, actually, and I, I put them on Twitter, I put them on my blog, and, and uh, the biggest thing probably is the max size increased to 150 gigabytes for a single database from 50, and the price stayed the same. So that's effectively at the high end a pretty huge price drop, which Microsoft needed to do, frankly, because they're getting competitive pressure from um, Amazon, who's got um, MySQL and now Oracle. And I had done a price comparison looking at 100 gigs of storage, put it on my blog, um, and I found that um, uh, the pricing for SQL Azure was not in line with the other um, relational offering on the cloud. So it's a good adjustment. Also, Federations has been, has been shown. So I'm going to jump out and show you some of the stuff. I'll start with the, um, the data tools. So um, what I have going on here is um, I have um, SQL Server data tools, which uh, integrate in a couple of different ways into existing Visual Studio. So once you would install this, the way that you'd see it is inside of here, and you'd scroll down, and you'd see, you'd see where, well, I can see this. I'm not sure. I'm looking here. SQL Server Data Tools. Here it is. SQL Server Data Tools. So that's what you'd see once it's properly integrated. 
So how that manifests itself is you get this new object explorer to work with relational databases. And if you connect, you can connect to a cloud or you can connect to non-clouds. If I go and click to a, connect to a cloud-based instance, I think this one should still work. Um, and what happens is you can then you know, work with it like you could in the old data node, but what's different with this is you can work both connected, which you might for an on-premise like this one, but you probably wouldn't for a, a cloud. So what you would probably do is, this one has one, one database here, is you'd right click and you'd create a new project, which would create an offline project. Um, and for purposes of time, I'm, I already made one basically. So what an offline project does is you can think of it like um, a DAC pack, um, but sort of above and beyond a DAC pack. It creates the scripts for the, the schema. Um, so I'll, I'll show what that does. So I've got one created over here. So you can see that I've got um, the schema uh, for the various, various objects. Um, and interesting, what it also does is it creates a local copy of it. So you can see here's the local copy. It's like a lightweight version, kind of like what um, we've had for a long time with things like the web server, where we had a lightweight web server so we could try things out in Visual Studio without installing a web server. Same concept. We have a lightweight SQL server here. So um, the other things that are really interesting about the data tools is they're uh, designed to do a bunch of um, tasks that a lot of people use their party tools for before. So things like um, you can, you know, um, bring in, you know, DAC packs. You can bring in, um, you can in, uh, bring in um, the metadata from another database by just connecting to it, which can be cloud or, or not. You can bring in SQL scripts. You can snapshot. So if you if you snapshot, and this may not work, so I didn't build it. Um, yeah, okay, let me just say save. Uh, let me just go to a local location here and just make a little folder. So I say test or something, test for webcast. Um, and you have to build first. But what that does is that creates, um, used to be a SQL X file, but I think in this release they changed it to a, um, a DAC pack file. And let's go in here and just have to say project. Okay, so it says save, save. So, so, okay, oh, it's because of where it is, okay. So let me just try and build it uh, and see if it'll build. Okay, and then let's, it looks like it's failing on the save, so it won't take too much time with it. I'll just go in some weird spot here. Okay, yeah, it's because of where, it, where it's saved. In any case, what, what happens is um, you can create this snapshot, and let me just try it, so we'll do it. Now, I won't do it. And I believe it's a DAC pack file, and it's, it's a point in time on the schema, and then you can do, um, this is what I was trying to get to, a schema compare, which is really sort of handy. And again, there are a lot of third-party tools that, that did this before. So basically what, what you've got is you, you're going to do a comparison here um, between some score, source schema and some destination schema. So you can say, well, all right, this is, the source is this, this project. And then I can say, all right, I'm going to select a target. And the target could be another project, it could be a database, or it could be a DAC pack file. So if I said, you know, database, I'll just, let's start to my um, cloud or something, because I have a local copy that was my DBA was using for testing. So, oh, it looks like I don't, don't even have, I'll just pick another one here. So I know this is not cloud, but I'll just pick it, because you can, you can sort of use it. So now I'm here and say, okay. And they'll say, okay, and then it's going to do a compare um, of all the data, uh, metadata, uh, and policy, and any other scripts or anything. Now, obviously, this is really, really small, so it's going to go really fast. And it's going to show you, like, what objects are new, what objects are changed, and then you can have a script um, that you can save out or you can apply the changes. So the idea is to be able to work with, um, so you can see, like, for example, here's a table that, like, wasn't there, um, and you can sort it out by, um, you know, uh, like you know, the the uh, the action. Uh, you can sort of buy this schema. So it's handy, just handy tools. So um, targeting. So let me show you where that is. So you can see here's the different target platforms, and then you'll get the intelligence for that particular platform. So data tools are cool. They not only help with cloud, they help with productivity in general. And notice they go all the way back to 2005. So um, it's just a, it, it's one of my favorite things actually coming with 2012 because I prefer I want to work in Management Studio, but um, it's all good in here and see if it's about my sound quality. Hopefully that's here. Go off and say no. 
Okay, so next thing, um, you'll see that uh, this is one of my trial account here. So if I want to create a new database, I can now create business up to 100. Well, I have the ability to not only work with my um, Azure account, which has a, a compute, but it also, if you will. So it has, I also can work with my, you know, relational. Uh, and it is like replication. Okay. So this might take a minute because my I'm doing a lot of work in Europe. Um, so I didn't pre-cache this. So what happens is you set up synchronization between spaces uh, across different locations. And you synchronize at the level of an individual object or a filtered object, which could be like, you know, filter table or view. If you synchronize with on-premise, then you get a little um, agent job, which basically does the synchronization. So it's a, it's a way for you to distribute data. It looks like this might be taking too long. So if it doesn't, it doesn't pick up here in a minute, I'll just switch to something else. While we're waiting for this, um, I'll also point out that there is this reporting. Let me actually see if it will come up faster. Um, and what this is, is this is SQL Server reporting services, but the rendering for the reports is hosted in the cloud. So you just get an endpoint, and then and you um, upload your RDL files to that endpoint. And then um, when you access them, the rendering is on, on basically that'll come up. This is cache, so that'll come up a little faster. So the next thing that's interesting, and this got announced uh, yesterday, I think, is when you go and you say uh, manage, what has now happened, and I did pre-cache this, so it'll come up sooner, is you get a um, um, metro style, Silverlight portal. So I don't know how much I like fancy, but you know, it's kind of cool. Um, some of the things I like here, in addition to the fancy, uh, you can see here's the, here's the, this, this, and this, is you have um, a dependency graph, which is interesting. So you get that by going here to the administra um, sorry, going to the design, and then you go to the dependencies, and then you click the dependencies. I'll just pick another one, so I'll make one quick like. And then that's gonna, aw, I wonder why that, isn't this made me timing out? All right, let me just refresh. I'll bring this one back. It could be because the team's literally updating for this other Hadoop thing. I'm going to show you in a minute. Let me see if this will go. This is fancy, and you can see what this design is. It's kind of cool. It shows the the tables that are dependent, and it also shows other objects. So let me see if I can refresh this and see what happens. Hmm. All right, let me go out of here because I I really like to show you this back to the portal and go back and connect really quick like so I'm going to uh, go here and I'm going to manage so what's interesting about this and why you might want to pay attention is because um, because this portal is hosted in Azure when there's new functionality that comes up it um, it's a management tool that can be refreshed without you having to install anything um, the uh, Functionality will come all the way down to Management Studio, but of course, because that's on your computer, you have to install updates to get it. So even if you're the kind of person who says, well, I wouldn't really use a lightweight you know, web-based tool, um, if you are using either Windows Azure or SQL Azure, I recommend that you do you know, take a look at the tools. So uh, while it's connecting, let's see, what else do I want to show you? Azure, Azure. I know what I was showing you with the portal being updated. I did show you the data tools with the version targeting. And then I was showing you some of the offerings uh, that Microsoft has in the cloud in terms of data. So to be clear, there's NoSQL, which is basically Windows Azure uh, blobs or tables. There's Relational, which is SQL Azure, which has had some good um, enhancements uh, lately, the price drop, max size, and the federations. And uh, then there is something called um, Windows Azure Data Market. And let me maybe just pop over to that. Oh, it looks like this did come up. So okay, so I'm back in SQL Azure. And uh, now I'll go to administration, see if this is a little bit more snappy. Could be I'm running out of bandwidth. Oh, all right, if it's not, not going gonna, not gonna to be snappy, then I'll switch to the other thing. Yeah, that's going. All right, so now I'm going to see the dependencies of, let's see, let's do girlfriends. Dependencies, see if it works. So it's like a database diagram. Kind of cool. So that's neat, that's live, yay, that worked. And then uh, let's go here and do a query. And some, something else that's neat that I wanted to show you is it added in this release. Uh, I'll just do something really easy. And you can see the estimated execution plan in here, which is neat. 
because you know you can do query tuning, right? So here's the total, here's the CPU, and I mean obviously this is simple as possible query. And here's the IO. So kind of a neat, neat set of enhancements. And you can also see this um, statistically and also in a tree. So I really like the fact that you can now see the query tuning inside of here. This really adds to the value and really puts Microsoft ahead of the other vendors because their tools just aren't, aren't looking as strong as Microsoft's tools. So happy for these things. So let me go back and see. Oh, I was going to show you the data market. So another offering here is a Windows Azure data market. Um, and what that is, is if you've got a data set that you um, want to sell um, access to, you can um, use Windows Azure Marketplace, and it, it's part of the data story. So um, you can see uh, it's at datamarket.azure.com, and once you sign up, then you can, I, I suggest if you're interested, you play around from a consumer standpoint first. You can go in and you can sign up for these free data sets, and you can play around with them. So you can say, all right, I want to look at this weather data, and some are free just to try out some, this is just generally free. And then inside of here, you can um, consume this data uh, by, uh, trying it out, um, usually in Power Pivot, Tableau, or you can um, use it in, in Visual Studio so that it can consume it as O data, basically. Ah, this is going to take too long. So I don't have a data set that I picked for this. So let me see if I can find one quick like. Because it's kind of neat. Um, and it goes to what we're going to be talking about in a minute here. So let's go to free. And let's go to, let's say, you know, there's a travel one. Let's go to uh, uh, do that. I don't want to take too long. This is how you get to the, the thing where you um, can just see it. But what they have some um, websites data. So if you wanted to integrate it in your application, so kind of kind of an interesting set of rings. There are there's more things coming for the cloud. A lot of cloud stuff. So we got this import export inside of SQL Azure. It's got data sync to get move data around, um, you know, like between your 2012 instance and Azure. Um, we've got import export, which moves data to Windows Azure blobs, which is like um, NoSQL. Um, you, uh, the, the data team also put out this simple page to upload data. I put a link to it. it basically, has two buttons on it. It says upload to SQL Azure, upload to Windows Azure. Um, we looked at um, the thing. I'm really excited to be able to show you, uh, got announced today, actually this morning, is uh, integration into um, NoSQL that comes from the open source world, from, from um, actually from Google, strangely enough. Um, so there's a, one of the big NoSQL databases is, of course, Hadoop. And um, there's a whole bunch of um, connectors that were um, introduced that I want to talk to you about. So let me, let me show you what they look like. So I showed you that. So there's, there's three aspects to this as best as I can figure it out. It, it really literally was announced this morning, that sort of the final thing. I had sort of early access to some of the other stuff. Um, but there is a connector, which I show on this slide, which it allows you to connect to um, SQL Server 2008 already. And what you can do is you can move back and forth um, uh, text files between Hadoop um, and SQL Server, and it uses one of Cloudera, which is a third-party vendor, one of their um, uh, integration pieces. I, I think it's called Scoop, if I remember right. It's pretty, yeah, Scoop-based, as it says. So um, with Hadoop, and this is a whole new world for most, most of us in SQL Server that I'm learning as well, um, you work with the Hadoop data using MapReduce, which is, uses Java at its core, but it, it, there are also some higher-level languages that sit on top of that which you can use. Um, there's something called Pig. Funny enough, there's a language called Pig Latin. I'm not kidding you. Um, that will process uh, or you know retrieve certain types of data out of the large set of information you might have. And then there is a, a query language called Hive, which you can um, write SQL-like queries, T-SQL-like queries. It's called HQL against um, Hive structures or Hive tables. So the way the sample works, because I've actually played around with this sample, is you um, you uh, can use this connector, which that one I haven't used, but the other, the other sample that the team let me take a look at that I think they're releasing out more broadly today is the Excel sample. And what that does is that uh, has you install a local instance of Hadoop on your Windows machine, which um, you set up, it's called Isotope, that's the code name. You set that up and then you run, um, you have a, a, a big file 
and then you run a, a MapReduce job to bring that into your uh, Zoo um, implementation, and then you run a script to create um, your table. And the way that I've seen, seen this, I haven't got it fully working yet on my machine, it's probably due to the fact that my configuration is different than Microsoft, I've been working with the team to be fair, is you, you'll see, as I, I've seen this screenshot, you have inside Excel, you have a Hive data pane, and then you connect to the local Hive server, and then you pick the object, and then you, it's pretty much like a table, and then you do the Hive QL, so you can do the analysis in, inside of Excel. So um, that's cool and interesting, but the thing that the, the team actually released today that I literally, right before the call, was trying out, and I'm going to show you guys, I'm kind of excited to show you, is this thing. This is a Windows Azure deployment of Hadoop on the Elastic MapReduce portal. So um, you have to get a code from the team, and I don't know how quickly they give them out to the general public, but I, I got mine pretty fast. So you go to the Hadoop on Azure, and then you put it in the code, and then you request a cluster, and then you say how many nodes on the cluster, you put a log in, and then you look for the allocation. And I actually literally did that before um, the uh, webcast here, and I'm going to see how it turned out. So here's my Hadoop on Azure, and I can see there's my, my cloud app, and I've got um, the ability to create a job, so that would be a, a MapReduce job, and then I have um, my cluster, and here's uh, Hot, there's nothing going on, no high queries are running. And again, the idea with this is you have so much data. Um, you know, this is non-structured, this is schemaless, so you're, you're putting data that is not transactional. You're putting data that, I, I like to call it behavioral, um, so maybe data from sensors. An example I like to use is rather than capturing what I bought at a mall, this would be capturing like where I went at the mall, which is probably you know, 20 to 30 or even 40 times as much as what I bought. I might have bought two things, but maybe I went to 40 stores. So, and it could, you know, obviously it could be even more than that. So, the, there's so much data that you might be running history, the job history. So, I'm actually going to just tempt fate, and then you put your parameters in. That looks fun. So, I'll definitely be playing with this because you know that I love new technology. And let's see what happens if I go to the interactive console. So, I can just play with this a little bit more remote desktop. I could open some ports, and then I've got. Let me see what's in the samples. If there's anything, Pi. I'm just going crazy here, doing stuff out. And Hadoop, um, final thing, well, this is what I see, 11, oh, looks like it's relatively fast. Number of, yeah, so it's, see, there's the map and the reduce, so it's just running. So I'm going to let that run for a minute. All right, that is not the cloud. Boy, yes, I am. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the core engine enhancements. Notice the things Microsoft talked about, though, when they talked about the value prop for SQL 2012. They did not mention, they have the, Breakthrough Insights, which is BI, they have the Mission Critical, which is always on, and they have the Cloud on Your Terms, which those are the things they talk about. I, I'm kind of old school, believe it or not, and I think some of the things that are, are enhancements for T-SQL, um, like the new sequence generator, the new way to write paging, um, adding the, the word throw to the structured exception handling, enhanced execute, these things are important to me. So I've got some sample scripts I'm going to be getting into in just a minute, but when you pull these slides down, there's a lot of... Um, uh, links and stuff so you can you can get more detail on this. Also a whole bunch of new SQL functions that I'm going to use like concat and format and choose and IEF and got lots of date and time functions. Got some conversion functions. I have I have samples of, of these as well. Then the the other thing that I think is interesting is we have um, engine and data type enhancements. So this idea of partially contained databases um, it comes out of support for the always available, the, the, the failover groups, because if you have a, a database that is contained where the logins aren't tied to a server, that they're specific to a database, you can, you can more easily move it around. Same thing with moving it from on-prem to SQL Azure. But it has a lot of other implications as well. Um, also, for geospatial, a lot of us are using geospatial, especially with all this behavioral data. Um, there's um, quite a bit of enhancement to this. I included a link to a white paper. I'd recommend that you read um, better complex shape support, precision, better aggregates, and indexing. So I have examples of all of this engine sort of core improvements. To be clear, we're connected now over here to, um, to uh, uh, 2012 RC0. All these code samples I'm going to show you over the next slide, though. I'm going to just switch to the code demos uh, database. And it's just a relational database, kind of back in our comfort world. Uh, sequences come from Oracle, um, and the idea is the decimal, 3, 0, start with 1 or 2, means, you know, go around the cycle again, and you can cache values if you want to. So creating a sequence, 
and the sequence is created. You can also create this in the GUI um, under programmability, but I thought it'd be more just, I don't know, practical to show this. this. And then we've got um, a DMV, sys.sequences, and we can, can show the sequence. And there's the sequence down here. You can see the sequence demo, the object ID, so on and so forth, and all the metadata about it. And then we can see the next value, which if we're starting with 102, should be 102. And if we want the next value, it should be 104 because we're incrementing by two. So um, there is, I think I have, yeah, I won't bother to run it, but basically what you do is you use this um, select next value, and this is from the MSDN samples. How you populate is you insert using the X value. That's how you populate it into a table. So pretty simple. More flexible than the identity stuff. Uh, it just, you know, something you'll probably use. So go ahead and get rid of that and close that out. So the next thing is, let's do page numbers. So page numbers, again, simple, just something you'll probably use. So in the code demos data, database here, just run that, make sure it's working. And we used to use row number. So now we're going to use um, this uh, offset and fetch next. So select star from your customer table, order it in by ID, offset 100 rows, and fetch, fetch next 10 rows. So that's offset the number of rows, fetch next the number of rows. And the way that that looks is like this. And you can see it starts at 100, and we use 10. So if we wanted to say fetch next 15, we wanted to offset by 105, then we could do that as well. There you go. So simple, easy to use. Okay. So the next, get this. Uh, all right. So here we got. These are like a lot of utility functions. So again, inside of code demos, and here's format. So format in France last week had a wonderful time. Here I'm going to just say, uh, give me the date, and I want it and in a value format is just a call format. That's a beautiful thing. Time I think date rather than date. And then here's um, we're going to do it as money using German money, and there we have the German money format. Okay, so simple. Uh, then concatenation, 200, 2 to 254 arguments. Uh, you can have nulls and you can cat simple enough. End of month, it's the last day of a specified month. So we got date time, get date, select the end of the month as this month, next month. So the argument is, we say, uh, let me go, and then particular month. Okay. All right, next one is choose. So um, I just changed, this is kind of a fun example I found, I kind of changed it up a little bit. So months to remain pregnant. So we're going to concatenate, the baby is due on the last day of months to remain pregnant. We're going to do a choose. So this is like um, going into an array, and um, the first argument is how many months. So if you're months to remain pregnant, then you're going to go to the selection. Which is that? Which is state. So, say choose. Yeah. And then the last one here is if, which SQL will translate to a case, and you can nest up to ten levels. So here, I just made them the numbers so it's easier to read. So we have three and five, and then we have actually I don't even need this f. And then we have uh, null. So um, so how, how do the comparisons work with nulls is basically what this is showing. So this is just showing when you're going to return the larger, what a nested looks like. You can nest up to 10 levels. And this will translate into a case, by the way, um, which is interesting for, for performance. And then the null comparisons, how it works. So I think I'm running slim on time. So I'm going to tell you I have geospatial and containment, but I'm going to just switch back and kind of get to the, the wrap-up parts. So, all right, so we did that. Resources, SQL Server 2012. I'm going to be spending lots of time um, detailing out a lot of these topics, so go to my blog. Um, I'll be working on the Hadoop stuff. I'm writing courses for Developmenter, so if you're interested in having me come out and do a custom course for your group or come to an open enrollment, let Developmenter know. Um, love to, to teach you more. Um, also, since I'm talking, I uh, also work with a group 
that is called Teaching Kids Programming. Uh, we are recently funded by the, uh, supported by a global foundation called the Mona Foundation, and we write courseware to introduce children ages 10 and up to uh, programming. So uh, it's all free and available at this site. So if you're interested in teaching with us, we teach regularly personally in Orange County, and we train teachers all over the world. We're writing courseware, let us know. We're, we're very interested in adding um, big data courseware for kids in 2012 as well. So thanks for listening in. I hope that you find this useful. Um, really hard to summarize all that's in 2012 in an hour. Uh, you know, let's continue this journey together. So follow me on Twitter, um, RSS my blog, or you can hire me because I'm out on my own these days. So you can hire me through Developmentor to teach, or you can hire me to build. Um, and I live in uh, Southern California, and I prefer working here, although I can travel. Anyway, I'm going to look in the queue and see if there are any questions. Now would be a great time to ask them, um, and I'll stay on for a couple more minutes. I thank those of you that stayed on with me for listening, and uh, you know, if you have questions, the best way to reach me is through my blog. So I'm trying to open the little question thing right now. Let's see if there are any questions. All right, and I'm looking. I'll wait a minute or two if you're typing in questions. Okay, it doesn't look like any, so thanks again for listening, and I um, hope you found this to be valuable. And again, uh, feel free to reach out to me through my blog if you have uh, questions that occur after listening in. Thanks again. Take care.